Hello, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to you all, wherever you are in the world. Thank you for participating to this third part of the webinar series, Reach New Archival Audiences. My name is Manuel. I'm the moderator today. In our last webinar, we talked a lot about prioritizing connection. So if you missed that, you can watch the last webinar on the website at lucidia.com forward slash archivera forward slash resources. Well, today's topic is fostering creativity. And it's led by none other than Margo Note, an experienced archiving expert, consultant, practitioner, and advisor. But before we begin, I would like to share what our company is about. Our mission is to define how knowledge is shared. What we do is we work with museums, archives, and libraries, and other information professionals to provide not only better access, visibility to your collections, but also educational resources like this for your projects and archives. We are made of numbers of products and companies that have joined Lucidia over the last 30 years. And these brands include well-known products such as Sydney, Inmagic, Argus, Archivera, Eloquent, and Quadrastar. So in order for us to provide more values to you, we've worked closely with thought leaders, experts, and we are honored and grateful to have one of our guest speakers here today on this webinar to share her knowledge with you. Margot Note is an author, archivist, records manager, helping individuals, art organizations harness their history. As a principal of Margot Note Consulting LLC, she facilitates the understanding of the importance of unique collections, suggesting ways to manage them and use them to tell stories to connect with people. Uh, presenting today is none other than our respected speaker author, Margot Note. Hi everyone. Um, so I'm really excited to talk today, today about kind of the creative aspects and creative engagement of archives, because I think this is something that there's so much potential in our holdings that we're only just tapping into. So creative engagement means, you know, exploring culture, identity, memory, social system, and politics that are within all our collections, no matter what materials we might have. And artists can come into the archives and both think like an archivist, they can think as an archival user, and also as a commentator of the archive. So there's kind of different lens, lens that they can use to approach the archives and to use the archives for their creative pursuits. So I should have a little caveat here. So there is some understandable reservations because whenever you talk about opening up the archives for kind of non-traditional or non-traditional uses or uses that are kind of push the boundaries of what, what has been done before, there are some reservations in the part of the archivist. So one aspect is removing the context um, of these materials can impact the future understanding. As archivists, we think of archives as, collect, as uh, groups. So box, folder, um, series, subseries, we don't necessarily think about archival material as items, but users sometimes think about our materials as items, especially if these items are digitized. So artists using our collections might only be looking at one specific piece of, of a huge folder or box, and so that context is removed. So I think we have to ask some questions, you know, is it acceptable to allow material to be potentially misrepresented? And where does our duty to defend archival integrity begin and end? These are, I think, perpetual questions as, as archivists we're asking ourselves as uh, materials are being used. So there's kind of some assumptions that are tucked into those questions. Um, one is that there's one correct interpretation inherent in primary sources, which is simply not true. The whole reason that we keep primary sources and the reason that we don't um, mess with provenance or original order as, is because there can be multiple interpretations of these primary sources. And what we learned with history, especially is, you know, history is always changing because our interpretation of those primary sources are always changing. Another assumption is that archivists possess the right to establish correct understandings, which is not true. We can, uh, we can advise, but we don't have that right. Um, and we don't have that knowledge. We're not an all knowing being, right? Um, and then another assumption is that archivists can judge whether users have interpreted the items correctly, which is simply not true. Um, we don't, we can provide access, we can advise, um, we can sometimes say no, the use of whatever 
projected use that you want to use in the archives is, you know, we won't let you use it. But we really have no way of being the ultimate judge of an interpretation of these materials. So the way to um, satisfy user needs, but also to protect ourselves and our holdings and the collections is to set boundaries. And we should do this in our personal and professional lives. You know, boundary setting is very important. So there is kind of an inherent tension between archives users and donors. I think that's good. You know, we're not all on the same page. There can be some friction between the three. And I think that's a good thing for scholarship and research. Um, the way that we set boundaries is through use and access policies. So trying to be as wide open as we can with use and access, understanding the nature of our collections, and then also having donor agreements. So making sure that when those deeds of gift come in with those acquisitions, that we're really clear, um, that we're really clear in telling the donor how these materials might be used. So they're not surprised by anything. And again, the, the boundaries that are being set and the kind of the amount of use and access and kind of non-traditional use of archives is going to be unique to your organization. There are some organizations that are really wide open to these usage. usage. And then there's other organizations that are very um, narrowly focused. I know one um, past client of mine have very sensitive um, documents that um, they, they really limit, they, they keep their archives very internal and there's a lot of internal use. And so this project I was working with them was to figure out how to digitize a selection of those materials and make them available for use. And there's a lot of stages and permissions that we had to do to go through that. That organization uh, was sensitive about the use of their collections because they had uh, they wanted to protect those collections for a variety of reasons um, for their past clients and their past uh, employees, um, but also because of the sensitive nature of those documents in the wrong hand could be used against them or could be used to um, cause damage to the organization. So again, it really depends on your organization and how um, open or close it is to this particular type of access. So programming, no matter what type of archives that you have, can be very um, helpful in being uh, fostering creativity. So programming can um, exposes a wide range of people to arts of all kinds. It promotes local art organizations and individual artists, kind of local artists within the community and their organizations. And it also provides opportunities for users to interact with artists in their community. So you, your archives can become kind of a creative hub purely through programming, not necessarily through their collections. So there's national programs that are more um, history-based and more arts-based. So these are a few of the, the big ones that, um, that are real opportunities um, to do some programming with your collections. I should let me just go back for a second. And I should say the reason that I um, mention these national programs is because a lot of times they have um, programming tip sheets and um, uh, text that you can use and messaging. So they do some of that heavy lifting of the programming for you that you could just kind of swipe um, some of the text and think about how to schedule things. You know, they do they do that thinking for you. So again, knowing as archivists, we're kind of limited in our staffing and in our time and in our resources. If we can look to these bigger organizations to give us some ideas about the programming, it just makes these things that much easier for us to do, but also to bring to our leadership to say that we should do this as well, because we're not spending so much time trying to program every detail of it. So I'm going to take a little, so that's kind of one way of thinking about creative archives through programming. I'm going to switch tracks a little bit and talk about kind of artist-based archives. Um, so before I do that, I want to talk about traditional archives, the archives that, are, that we're used to, that we went to library school about. Um, so traditional archives, of course, um, they organize collections through appraisal, accessioning, processing, and preserving. It provides access. To these materials. So we both preserve, we organize things, we preserve things, and then we provide access. The records in the archives are no longer in active use. So if we think about the records life cycle from the creation to the very end, where we decide 
with usually a records manager, you know, do we keep these things permanently or permanently with quotes, or do we destroy them after um, a certain amount of time? These are the records that are no longer no longer being used, but we want to preserve for the very long term. And when we preserve them, there's going to be no further modifications other than preservation. So maybe we'll change the format of the records or we'll put it in new housing. But for the most part, they're non-active and they're kind of organized the way that they are. That's traditional archives that we all know and love. Artist-driven archives are kind of different. And I've been seeing more um, discussion and uh, discussion about artist-driven archives in a little bit in the archives field, but certainly outside the archives too. And for me, I'm particularly interested in what the public thinks about archives, not necessarily what archivists think of archives. Um, so artist-driven archives highlight how creators turn to archives for inspiration. It's a result from an ongoing creative process the materials are still in active use. So if you think about traditional archives, they're not active. These records tend to be um, active. They're being used and modified in time. And um, they may shift over time rather than preserved in the original order. So they're kind of a living archives. They're still archiving a particular moment, but they're still um, growing and changing over time. And they're a source of uh, creativity. They articulate something about the artist's ongoing body of work and their process, um, and they choose the form that their archives take. I think what's interesting about them is even though they're kind of moving and changing all the time, um, it does bring a consistent creative practices to the archives. So I had a past client um, years ago who was a photographer, and she was very creative in her process, but she had these final um final results or like final photographs that had names and were kind of she wanted to keep as is so working with her i was really thinking about and sometimes she would take old photographs and remix them so i was thinking about working with her specifically what can i do that doesn't impinge on her creative process so she can still remix and reuse and i wouldn't be putting any structure or limitations in, in what she did best after she had a final result where there's a photograph that was complete, it was not to be further modified and it had a name, how can we ensure that that, that photo, final photograph is being kept as is? How can we find it and how can it be preserved over time? So that had to do with file naming procedures, file formats, writing an inventory of what these uh, photographs were and having it in uh, Adobe, I think it was Lightbox or uh, Adobe software equivalent that would be keeping these files. So again, I allowed her, I didn't kind of uh, try to change her creative process, but I did try to have structure on those final things. So then these photographs would not be corrupted over time because of file formats or file changes. So I think there's an interesting thing happening with time. So the present versus the future. So artist-driven archives are aimed at being accessible to broad audiences in the present. So making sure this is accessible now as they're being used, rather than, let's say with traditional archives, is existing primarily for research in the future. It's kind of funny, traditional archives, we think about the present, we certainly think about the past, and we really project into the future. But these artist-driven archives are really thinking about the present moment and the creative, uh, the present creative process. And so that allows, you know, expand on the accessibility of the work to new audiences. So audiences kind of can kind of peek in on that creative process. So there's new discoveries that happen to these types of archives. So we learned something about the art when it was first created as a user. Um, we can experience the artistic process, experiment with creating their mix of materials, and it brings users into the art making process. I think this is particularly interesting with any type of choreography archives where people are looking at past the past choreography for inspiration, reinterpreting that um, choreography, capturing that choreography, choreography, <laughs> 
it's very hard to say that multiple times. It's a tongue twister um, through video or for writing down um, the steps or the, the ideas that are generated from those dance moves. So there's a premium placed on access. So again, present access. So a lot of these artist-driven archives employ digital, online, or innovative platforms. There's sometimes a museum or gallery exhibitions and installations, and there's live performances rather than a repository model that usually happens with traditional archives. So again, because this is archives, but it's kind of, kind of pushing the boundary of what archives looks like, it really reaches these new audiences that are into more the choreography or the creativity or the art of the archives, not necessarily the archives for archives sake. And I think anytime there's opportunities where we can bring people to archives in outside of the repository, I think that's good to educate people about archives. The power of these uh, records of enduring value, I think is very valuable. And it helps us as a pro profession, even if people are doing things that are kind of wildly different than what we're used to. So traditional and creative archives, um, again, artist-driven archives are not replacement for traditional repositories. Um, the latter the traditional repositories are always going to have a, some say in scholarship. They're going to lead the academic world. They're going to lead scholarship. Um, but artist-driven archives offer opportunities to engage with, with work in new ways. And I think, as I was saying previously, you know, we as archivists, even if you have an institution that would never have artist driven archives or, you know, be open to this or have any type of subject matter interest in this, I think we can always learn from those who push the boundaries of innovation of access and outreach to see what other people are doing just to see if we can maybe open a few doors within our own uh, repositories ourselves. Um, so that's the second track I was talking about. The third track is about engaging with artists. And I think this might be the piece that I think is more applicable to many institutions. Even if you have um, holdings that are not related to art at all, that are not artistic, that might be STEM based or um, corporate in some way, or just not creative in any kind of way. So for some institutions, serving artists is a core component of their identity. I think of the Harry Ransom Center where they have um, literary archives, so writers would go there. Or um, Juilliard has an archives where a musician would go there. Or the New York, New York Public Library has theater archives. You know, there's, uh, Smithsonian has art archives. You know, there's certain places that obviously their holdings are going to attract creative people without having to even think about it. But again, whatever type of repository you have, there are some ways to engage with creative communities to allow them to explore the collections and then find inspiration in the holdings as well. So doing so advances awareness. So again, we're kind of speaking outside of the reading room. We're, we're entering into the world and we're reaching out to potential new donors who have a creative kind of mindset. So it increases the visibility of institutions. I think this is especially important if you're a nonprofit and you're seeking um, donors or any type of grant making opportunities. When you have these really unique um, artistic projects or ways that we can reach these audiences, there are, I think that uh, excites people and it you know, perks the ears up of people that might not be into traditional archives as we know it. Um, there's an emphasis on the arts within archival repositories. And again, it advances the awareness of records of enduring value. Any time that we can speak to new audiences, you know, this is this is what I encourage and what we want to do. And the reason that you're here at this webinar. So there's outreach opportunities, and I'm going to go through several of them. Um, you can develop artist workshops. So is there some type of programming that you can do within your repository that would engage with artists. You can host artist residencies for the archives. I think this is really an interesting piece. It does take a particular amount of planning um, to do so, but I think this would be a really cool way to have someone, an artist that's nationally known or locally known, to be, you know, have a residency in the archives and just kind of bring some excitement to that area to see what they do with your holdings. 
you can create materials that highlight the arts resources or the history of local arts. So if you're known in your area for, let's say, a particular type of art, murals or an artistic community or whatever you're into, I think this is a way to talk about that art historically in your area. There's other outreach opportunities. We can partner with arts groups or other organizations that serve artists. Um, we can work with local art schools for research tips, tours, and open houses. This is a great way for partnerships. So if you have a local art school or um, art college or art university or art department in your area, you can invite them in, especially if you're not, it, it, this works especially with the university archives, but if you are an institution that's kind of outside um, that group, that's a great way to have some partnerships. Um, and you can also find ways to increase the digitization of materials, including audiovisual resources. I know for me, I always default to text-based archives. That's kind of where my love is. And then sometimes I think about kind of visual archives like Im imagery and art, but I think AV archives, I think are particularly interesting for people that want to create um, film and video and any type of AV art out of your materials and, and using those materials as a primary source um, to do that. You can uh, mount exhibits based on the aesthetics of the materials rather than the historical significance. I think, again, as archivists, we tend to come to this field through history or kind of the humanities. And we don't necessarily think about the visuals or the aesthetics of things. We think about the subject matter. But again, we can kind of turn that on its head and really think about what are the aesthetics that we want to talk about. If that seems too strange or unfamiliar to us, we can also allow artists to curate the exhibition. So kind of opening up the holdings and have them take a look at what you have and see what kind of weird and interesting connections they can make with your holdings, um, especially because they're not coming from the point of view of provenance and original order and the idea of, you know, a collection is based on one creator, a second creator, a third creator. They're thinking kind of um, almost horizontally across the collections and, and really getting some, I think, interesting connections between maybe collections that have nothing to do with each other. And then improving outreach for non-traditional users. So of course it's easier said than done. We know on our, based on a repository, who are users, who are the, um, the people that we always see or the types of people that we always see. They tend to be maybe scholarly, academic, but how can we try to reach out to really interesting new users, people that we might've been um, hesitant to reach out to? How can we kind of open our doors to them and welcome them in? We can expand interdisciplinary efforts for outreach. So again, sometimes we think very uh, narrowly, uh, in a very narrow way about our collections. So if we have collections based on a type of, uh, I don't know, product or um, thing, a type of vehicle, for example, we, we kind of be very, very narrow about how we approach it. But if I think if we start to kind of expand and be more kind of think about similar uh, disciplines that could use these materials, I think we'd find some interesting connections there. We can develop materials on how the arts and history have influenced each other. I think this is especially important when we obviously tie it to our collections and perhaps tie it to our area as well. And we can host performances, readings, and events for artists. Now, of course, you know, we're still in a pandemic or wherever we are now. So maybe that might be virtual, but I think we should also think about in the future, the archives as um, a place, a gathering place. So like then we can bring people, non-traditional users into the archives. Maybe they're in the archives um, for an event or performance and then they learn about us. So we're, we're drawing them in. Once we get them to kind of go over that doorway, we're welcoming them in so they feel more comfortable. And of course, you know, you'll have to think about, you know, hosting and all that, what that might entail as far as uh, logistics, but that, that is, a, I think, quite interesting to think about archives as a space, a creative space for creative people. 
We can offer research services to local art commissions. So again, you know, um, finding ways that we can be useful to people so they learn about our services, learn about us. We can investigate art collecting initiatives depending on policies, of course. So maybe your institution does want to collect art or wants to um, have acquisitions in art-based things, or art-based collections. So this might be an opportunity to do so. And of course, pursuing arts research and digitization grants. You know, anytime that we can find an opportunity to raise some money to meet some of our needs, I think that's a win-win all around. So, I mean, obviously I kind of ran through a whole bunch of ways to do outreach um, in a way that would be attractive to artists and creative people. I think the underlining message, no matter what you decide to do, is that we have to be proactive in, in our outreach. So again, we have to find ways to reach those people rather than expecting them to come to us. Um, and so we can forge some of those relationships. So archives, of course, have um, compared to, let's say, a museum um, or a library that might have an arts collection, we tend to have fewer resources. We sometimes lack a robust online presence. Um, so for example, maybe we have finding aids online. Even if we do have finding aids online, most people are somewhat intimidated about finding aids or they're not unfamiliar with kind of archival practices. Um, and when we have specially focused collections, it might not appeal to broad audiences the way that a museum or a public library might. So we do have kind of a specialty focus. Um, so these are kind of different ways that, that a negative person would see this as, as a way of um, limiting outreach. But again, I think because we have, um, we know this about ourselves, having that proactive outreach to, to reach those creative communities is super important and something that cannot be overlooked and definitely part of this process. So if we do want to have that outreach to creative communities, we really have to think about the best way to reach those um, audiences in multiple messages so they, so they get what we're trying to say. Um, Oh, and a little bit more about proactive outreach. So sometimes uh, visitors misjudge the quantity and nature of resources. So again, our materials are in the stacks. They might not understand all that we have, the broad range of things that we have, because it's not available for browsing the way that a library um, might have holdings. The materials might not be easily described. So again, maybe there's a finding aid, maybe there's limited inventory. And um, that inventory might be harder for online researchers. So think about for the most part, the way that kind of contemporary users engage with archives is usually through a website first. So if your website is not the best at putting what the holdings are right in front or requires some digging around, that can be a kind of detrimental to these users. So again, just thinking about how can we be more welcoming? So all in all, um, you know, this was really exciting to think about because it, it definitely um, pushed my boundaries about what archives really can be and, and what those users potentially might be and new audiences to reach out to. So I think using archives in the creative process, it finds inspiration in the collections. Um, it offers diverse ways to use the materials. Again, it's not just academic, just scholarly use. It can be very creative use, very um, kind of nonlinear way of, of use as well. And I think the most important thing is that um, our staff expertise can help support the collection. So we don't have to be creative people. I mean, I, I think it certainly helps if we're thinking about creative use, usages, but we can help guide that process, we can use our expertise of knowing those collections to really help people in that creative process. And I think that's the real beauty and the connection of archives is that we can meet people where they are and satisfy those needs and really um, facilitate that creative process. Having a creative process for us is definitely something to think about. And thank you for sharing your experience experience and insight and knowledge, Margot. 
Before we wrap things up, there are three valuable books that you can download now for free at lucida.com forward slash archivera forward slash resources. The first one is the Digital Preservation Without Tears. Uh, this book is perfect for those who want to learn more about digital preservation concept, tools, and actions. And the second one is the Arch uh, Archivist Advantage choosing the right collection management system. So this book is perfect for those who want to learn more about an archivist's perspective and unbiased view on selecting CMS, types of collection management systems, benefits, risks of picking one over the other. And lastly, the demystifying archival projects, five essentials for success. And this is for anyone who has project that they're working on right now. It will be helpful for you to work on and provide new ways of thinking about your archival project. Uh, as you can see, we do have a lot of resources available, including our blog posts. And uh, if you have any questions, any questions about collection management system or any follow-up questions about this webinar, feel free to reach out to us. If you know a specific CMS requirements you need, we, we can help for sure. Uh, we will work with you to determine how our solution can support your goals. Thank you for attending today's webinar on reaching new archival audiences, fostering creativity, our goal for this series is to help you develop a strategy in order to reach new archival audiences. We're happy to have you join us today, and we hope that we, you will join us again for the next part of the webinar series. Bye for now.